we can all okay. 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 And then, and then all the, yes. and welcome to yeah. the 2008 2009 Pascal lectures. My name is David Matthews. I'm a faculty member in statistics and actuarial science, and I also have the privilege of serving this year as the chair of the Pascal Lectures Committee. We're delighted to see how many of you have turned out for this year's lectures. I better switch. And we look forward to shortly hearing okay. from Pascal Lectures. Yeah, okay. so. But let me tell you first about the lectures themselves. A little over 30 years ago, uh, a group of four faculty members here at the university, uh, all members of something called Christians on Campus, which was organized by a person named John North, who is a also a faculty member in English and was so then as well, um, began to explore possible ideas concerning how we might have a greater uh, presence as Christians on campus. And we came up with the idea of a, an annual lecture series. And as the idea unfolded, uh, we were pleased to discover that the university responded quite positively to the ideas that we were articulating. And the end result was that uh, in due time, the Board of Governors approved the establishment of the lecture series, and it became known as the Pascal Lectures on Christianity and the University at the University of Waterloo. And since that time, as you'll see by your program, we've had a number of very distinguished lecturers, um, beginning in 1978 with a founding lecture, if you like, by Malcolm Muggeridge on the end of Christendom, but not the end of Christ. And since that time, we've had uh, the various people that you uh, see mentioned on the back of your program, and we're pleased tonight to have with us the 2008-2009 Pascal Lecturer, Professor Dennis Alexander. And I'm going to invite our Associate Vice President Academic, Professor Jeff McBoyle, to come and introduce this year's lecturer to you. Jeff? <coughs> Thanks, David. Good evening, all, and welcome to the first of this year's Pascal Lectures. 15 days ago, February the 12th, celebrated 200 years since Charles Darwin, one of the world's most creative and influential thinkers, was born. 2009 was also the 150th anniversary of the publication of one of his seminal works, The Origin of Species. Darwin was a prolific correspondent and writer. Four of his key books relate to evolution. The Voyage of the Beagle, on the perpetuation of varieties and species by natural means of selection, on the origin of species, or by its full title, or on the origin of species by means of natural selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle of life. And lastly, the descent of man and selection in relation to sex. Interestingly enough, in the first edition of The Origin of Species, there is no mention of the word evolution. Today, Charles Darwin is more famous and more notorious than ever. Nowhere is this more evident than in the ongoing controversies over science and religion. Now, Darwin exchanged letters with nearly 2,000 correspondents in the course of his life. These letters, so state the Darwin and Religion website, quote, show that Darwin's world could mean many different things to different people. Some saw Darwinism as a threat to religion, but many found ways of reconciling their beliefs with an evolutionary view of life, end of quote. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. Dennis Alexander, the 2008-09 Pascal Lecture on the topic Rescuing Darwin. Dr. Alexander is a prominent cancer researcher 
at the Babraham Institute, Cambridge, England, where he supervises a research group on cancer and immunology. He specializes in the signaling pathways inside white blood cells. Dr. Alexander is also a director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion at the Edmonds College, Cambridge, as you saw on the slide. Now, the Faraday Institute is named after Michael Faraday, one of Britain's best-known scientists, who saw his faith as integral to his scientific research. The Faraday Institute has a Christian ethos, but encourages engagement with a wide variety of opinions concerning interactions between science and religion. The Institute brings together a group of scholars, mainly from the scientific community, who are actively involved in science-religion interactions through publishing and lecturing. Dr. Alexander is director of this institute. And as you probably have read in the handout that was given to you, he has published many books. But there's one thing interesting with his books. He likes to raise questions. We have in one of his books, Science, Faith and Ethics, Grid or Gridlock. We have in his most recent book, Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose? Tonight, Dr. Alexander will talk on rescuing Darwin, and tomorrow evening we'll address the topic, another question, is Darwinism incapable, incompatible with purpose? I now hand you over to Dr. Alexander and rescuing Darwin. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your welcome this evening. It's great to be here in the University of Waterloo. And uh, I want to thank the organizers of uh, this lecture series for this opportunity to, uh, to share with you in this uh, really rather wonderful series. We're just thinking it's probably one of the oldest um, series, I think, established series on this kind of topic in any university, certainly, that I, I've been in. And uh, I think it's fantastic that you have this uh, year on year. I have a particular... Um, affection also for this country which I in fact worked in for six months uh, I won't say how many decades ago that was just down the road here in St. Catharines and after that great experience which I had as a student I often thought I would come back here and uh, work here on a longer term basis in fact life took a completely different direction so I went off to the Middle East instead but here we are and it's good to visit back in Canada again I've actually been reading uh, Blaise Pascal's wonderful Ponce um, in preparation for this particular series and one of his uh, aphorisms in his Ponce I think won't really quite work for tonight because uh, Pascal wrote there do you wish people to believe good of you he asked and then gave his own advice don't speak and I just looked at that and thought that's probably not a good idea <laughs> for tonight but at least I will uh, try and keep to time if I can so now, as um, our chairman was just saying, it's really rather difficult at the moment to keep away from the fact of this double anniversary that we have um, for Darwin. And if you think it's uh, had some exposure here, you can imagine what it's like in England and even more so in, uh, in Cambridge, of course, where I'm from. Um, it's very difficult to get away from Darwin just at the moment. There's been this huge outpouring of articles and uh, radio programs, TV programs and so forth and more books than uh, you can ever possibly be able to keep up with. On Darwin's uh, birthday, in fact, I kept, uh, um, I took part in a wreath-laying ceremony in Westminster Abbey. We were all gathered to solemnly lay a wreath on, uh, on Darwin's tomb. A couple of days uh, before that, I had the privilege of sitting here in Charles Darwin's old room at Christ College in Cambridge, which at that time was still being refurbished. It's now just gone open to the public um, as of last Friday and I was being interviewed there for a BBC programme. 
Actually, we had quite a bit of fun afterwards poking around in Darwin's bedroom um, to see if we could find anything interesting because there's some of the exposed beams right by his bed. So we were looking, you know, to see if we could see some graffiti maybe, like Darwin slept here or something like that. But unfortunately, uh, we couldn't discover anything like that. Or had it been discovered, it could have been sold by the college, no doubt, for, for quite a lot of money. But anyway, it was wonderful to see his room refurbished and restored to its, uh, to its original kind of situation. Now, of course, um, as was suggested in a, a few moments ago, not everyone is quite so enthusiastic as I am myself, as a biologist, about Darwin's great discoveries. Recently in the UK, we had a bit of a surprise from um, a survey, a poll that was carried out. In fact, the first quantitative poll that we've had there, I know there have been many here in North America, but trying to find out what the level of belief in evolution or disbelief actually is in uh, the United Kingdom. I have to say um, that we had thought and our naivety that um, creationism was something that happened in uh, America and various places, but it didn't really happen in our country, that sort of feeling. And, and of course, um, the data show that we were quite wrong because it seems that about 10% of our own population turn out to be quite convinced. Young Earth creationists, 14% uh, hold to some form of intelligent design, 25% are really convinced evolutionists, and the remaining half of the population in the UK seems to be less certain, generally favoring, favoring evolution over other theories, but not really very convinced. So it seems that in the land of Darwin's birth, 150 years of biological education certainly hasn't convinced everybody um, that evolution is a good thing and provides indeed the best explanation for the origin of uh, biological diversity. And so of course then, us, we want to ask ourselves the question, um, how can that be the case? And I suspect there are several different reasons for this, um, but I want to focus on just one this evening, and I think it's the reason that brings us to this rather sort of ambiguous title um, that we've got before us, uh, Rescuing Darwin. Now, you might feel that given Darwin's fame and the fact that his theory now provides the framework within which all biological research is actually carried out, that certainly Darwin doesn't really need any rescuing. But of course it's not Darwin's science that actually needs rescuing, although clearly there's a need to communicate it more clearly out in the public domain. But I think it's rather the Darwin brand, the way in which Darwinism has become a battleground for competing ideologies that threaten to swamp the core scientific message. And my suspicion is that when 50% of the UK population recently display their doubts or outright disbelief in evolution in the poll that I just mentioned, they were not actually for the most part responding to the scientific uh, description of evolution at all, the scientific understanding, but rather to Darwinism as a philosophy or as an icon of a particular uh, cultural or political view, or even just as a threat to religious belief. And in fact, it's very common, isn't it, for these big theories of science to become socially transformed in some way or another, to be invested with various ideological or metaphysical beliefs, beliefs that go well beyond the scientific theory itself. And the typical process is that a, a big theory, usually it happens to the big theories in science, um, becomes very successful and then various interest groups move in to try and invest their particular ideology, their particular politics, whatever it might be, in the scientific theory in order to gain prestige for their extra scientific curriculum, if you like, from this particular theory. And unfortunately the end result is that in the public consciousness the actual meaning of the label given to the theory itself changes. And so you have the public understanding of scientific theory X becomes equated with this ideological uh, meaning Y. And I think the history of the reception of evolution provides a very good example of the way that process happens. So I'm sure you know Darwin has been recruited over these past 150 years in attempts to support a huge range of ideologies, many of them actually mutually exclusive, including capitalism, uh, socialism, theism, atheism, feminism, uh, eugenics, militarism, and racism, and probably quite a few other isms as well. 
I think it was George Bernard Shaw who once sardonically remarked that Darwin had the luck to please everybody who has an axe to grind. And I think the history of this reception well supports his, uh, his perspective on that. So the task of rescuing Darwin the biologist, Darwin the great natural historian, from his plethora of cultural interpretations is indeed a challenging one. So what I want to do for the rest of this evening is do two things really. First of all, to consider first of all, how Darwin's own religious beliefs and attitudes towards the utilization um, of his theory uh, actually doesn't fit very well at all with that kind of history that we've just been painting. And then to track some of the ways in which his theory um, has been used ideologically over the past 150 years. And then to see how actually that process is still, believe it or not, going on um, to the present day. And our first goal then to take a look at Darwin's life himself has been hugely helped by two wonderful uh, websites. If you're not, um, not aware of them, then, then do go to these websites. And they've already been, one of them is quoted from already by um, our chairman. First of all, this Darwin Correspondence Project, the aim to put all of his uh, 15,000 surviving letters up there on the web, including um, the other people he was writing to as well. A wonderful resource. And then the second great resource, the Darwin Online Project, the complete works of Darwin. So you can download all six editions of The Origin of Species and compare them, as some people are doing. Um, you can download Emma's diary. Emma, of course, was the wife of Charles Darwin. And so you can actually download a whole diary if you want to and read it. And read, uh, she was rather a good cook actually as well. And, uh, and wonderful on the piano, a very, very gifted Victorian lady. Um, but also, I suppose, a, a lesson to us that we need to be careful about our diaries. You know, you never know if you, if you become very well known or perhaps you're married to somebody who becomes well known, your diary might end up on the web one day. So I've often thought, ever since Emma's diary went up, be careful, you never know what might happen. Darwin's family background was, of course, quite wealthy. It was illustrious. It was somewhat unconventional by the standards of his time. His background contained uh, both Unitarians as well as um, atheists, not least his grandfather Erasmus Darwin, who was a free thinker, a rationalist, an evolutionist in his own way. Um, Charles Darn Darwin himself was raised an Anglican. His father was clearly not very impressed by Charles's achievements um, at Shrewsbury School, telling him, telling him that you care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and all your family. Close quote. So perhaps not the last father to misjudge his son's capabilities. Darwin was sent to Edinburgh University to study medicine at the tender age of 16. He found the lectures pretty dull. He found uh, watching operations without any anaesthetic, without chloroform, very disturbing indeed, as I think we all would. But it was in Edinburgh that Darwin developed an early interest in natural history, being strongly influenced by the sponge expert and radical Lamarckian evolutionist Robert Grant, whose political views were very far from those of Darwin's own rather respectable uh, Whig background. So Darwin finally left Edinburgh without a degree. He'd finally convinced his father of his utter loathing of medicine, who accordingly sent him off where else to study divinity at Cambridge. And Darwin recounts in his autobiography that at the time, and I quote, he had scruples about declaring my belief in all the dogmas of the Church of England, though otherwise I liked the thought of being a country clergyman. It was quite a nice sort of uh, kind of thing to do in those days. Um, and it mixed well, actually, with being a natural historian, if you, if you read about the early Victorian um, sort of country vicars. Accordingly, says Darwin, I read with care person on the creeds and a few other books on divinity, as I did not then in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible. I soon persuaded myself, notice that little phrase, I soon persuaded myself that our creed must be fully accepted. Close quote. So I think it would be fair to say that Darwin's Christian faith at this time was orthodox, it was respectable, it was reasonable, uh, but it wasn't particularly personal. Instead, it was a faith nurtured in the natural theology that was so influential in Britain during the first half of the 19th century. Now, natural theology, of course, comes in many different versions. 
but its overall project in the 19th century British context at least was to infer or support belief in God as creator by drawing attention to various properties of the natural world the evidences of Christianity natural theology by the Reverend William Paley first published right at the turn of that uh, 19th century these were classic works of natural theology that they were, they were read and memorised and indeed examined upon by generation after generation of Cambridge students and ironically or perhaps provincially when Darwin went to live in Christ College, Cambridge he was located in the very same room in fact where Archdeacon Paley had once resided when he had been a fellow there some decades previously in later life Darwin recalled again in his autobiography the great impact that Paley made upon him during his time in Cambridge writing that I am convinced that I could have written out the whole of the evidences book written by Paley with perfect correctness but not of course in the clear language of Paley the logic of this book and as I may add of his natural theology gave me as much delight as did Euclid the careful study of these works was the only part of the academical course which as I then felt and as I still believe was of the least use to me in the education of my mind now one of the passages that Darwin would have read in Paley's Natural Theology may with the benefit of hindsight be viewed as remarkably prescient and it's a passage I don't think many people have spotted but it actually identifies precisely the problem that Darwin was later to address so effectively as Paley was puzzling over the way in which organisms are well adapted to their environments he wrote there is another answer which has the same effect as the resolving of things into chance which answer would persuade us to believe that the eye, the animal to which it belongs, every other animal, every plant, indeed every organized body which we see, are only so many out of the possible varieties and combinations of being which the lapse of infinite ages has brought into existence? That the present world is the relic of that variety, millions of other bodily forms and other species having perished, being by the defect of their constitution incapable of preservation or of continuance by generation a bit of a long Victorian sentence but you get the message there so Paley rejected this possibility that he was raising partly because he just couldn't conceive of such a countless number of species disappearing when extant animals in general seem so well adapted to their environments but much later Darwin who remember said he virtually memorized these passages revived a very similar idea of course an idea which we now call and which he called natural selection Darwin's book on the origin of species has been called the last great Victorian work of natural theology because its thought forms are so obviously shaped by that tradition just by reading the famous closing words of the origin the sort of resonances that you have there uh, with Paley and other writers in natural theology are very clear Darwin writes there is grandeur in his view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved close quote and that's entirely correct the word evolution doesn't appear in the first edition of the origin of species the word evolved does and that's the only place and it's the very last word in the book now over this period we can actually trace Darwin's own gradual slide I think it's a slide really from um, Christian orthodoxy into deism and then finally into agnosticism during his famous voyage on the Beagle he was certainly uh, remained an orthodox uh, Christian during that time he writes many things about uh, the Christian faith in his Beagle diaries he was very impressed by the positive social impact of the missionary work that he observed during his travels his diary recalls how in Tahiti and I quote human sacrifices infanticide and bloody wars where the conquerors spared neither women nor children have all been abolished by missionary activity any voyager unlucky enough to be shipwrecked on some unknown coast should most devoutly pray wrote Darwin the missionaries had got there first the idea was you shouldn't end up in the pot I think was his thought there indeed Darwin supported a missionary society financially to the end of his days long after he himself had ceased to practice his own faith so his own loss of faith really 
began as a process I think after he came back, back from the Beagle Voyage in 1836 and it really wasn't much because of his science it was much more because he found he could no longer believe in specific Christian doctrines the rather orderly Palean world which had been easy to believe perhaps amongst those well manicured lawns of Cambridge colleges had been challenged by the sheer wildness of the wider world that he observed during the Beagle Voyage including devastating earthquakes including famines and many other things that were a shock to his a rather refined system but it was the personal challenge of suffering that probably did more than anything else to destroy Darwin's faith like many large Victorian families the Darwin family lost three uh, children while they were still children and their daughter Anne's lingering death at the age of ten was particularly devastating by the time Darwin wrote The Origin he was probably best described as a deist one who saw God as the remote lawmaker the one who originally breathed the life into a few forms or into one but not as a God who was personally involved in the daily workings of the world nor in the lives of individuals later on when Darwin's friend and defender Thomas Henry Huxley invented the word agnostic Darwin accepted the word gratefully as a description of his own position Sidney Darwin was never an atheist but he rather wavered between deism and agnosticism for the rest of his life my theology is a simple muddle he told Joseph Hooker in 1870 I cannot look at the universe as a result of blind chance yet I can see no evidence of beneficent design close quote but what's very striking is the way in which Darwin always shows respect and liking um, and politeness to those with whom he differed and his correspondence with Asa Gray professor of natural history at, the, at Harvard University and a great supporter of evolution provides I think a model for how an exchange of different views should be conducted Gray was a committed Christian who held to both evolution and the traditional argument from design and Darwin simply couldn't see how those two things could be reconciled but despite their strong differences of opinion there's always this mutual respect in their rather wonderful correspondence which has been <laughs> dramatized in a, in a drama called Redesign it seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist in my most extreme fluctuations wrote Darwin to John Fordyce in 1879 I've never been an atheist in the sense of denying this, the existence of a God why should you be so aggressive Darwin asked the atheist Edward Aveling shortly before he died is there anything gained by trying to force these new ideas upon the mass of mankind so misguided attempts to recruit evolution in support of atheism are nothing new but, but Darwin himself would, would have none of it we need to rescue Darwin from the image of an atheist battling religion in order to establish his new scientific theory an image propagated today to serve two very agendas by the new atheists on one hand who wish to invest evolution with atheism but also by the creationists on the other who wish to present Darwin as the wicked anti-theologian who undermines religious belief and in reality Darwin simply fits neither mould and he refused to ally himself with any campaigning ideology as Darwin wrote a letter to Henry Ridley 28th of November 1878 Dr. Pusey that's the Oxford divine was mistaken in imagining that I wrote the origin with any relation whatever to theology I should have thought that this would, would have been evident to anyone who has taken the trouble to read the book close quote well, quite so I would say so you know Darwin took great care to show that his writings didn't commit himself to meta-scientific uh, theories as we would now want to call them perhaps instead Darwin got on with his science much happier with his worms and his barnacles there in Down House his comfortable former parsonage in the country not far from London rather than being caught up with all the politics and religious controversies in many ways Darwin did end up living like the com comfortable country vicar as his father had planned for him surrounded by a big family an intelligent and dutiful wife and the usual retinue of Victorian servants he was a member of his parish council he regularly contributed to the village Sunday school he had his children christened at Down Church and he gave generously 
towards his upkeep, and he spoke warmly of Christianity's good influence on society. This Darwin wrote to the local evangelist, James Fegan, following his campaign in the village of Down. Your services have done more for the village in a few months than all our efforts for many years. Hardly the words, I think, of a radical atheist. And so if we need to rescue Darwin then from some of the distorted images imposed upon him in later centuries, we also need to restore a more balanced view of the way in which his great theory was received. There is still, I think, certainly in my country, an enduring mythology that after 1859, evolution faced a concerted campaign of opposition from the church. But the truth is far more complex. Like any significant new scientific theory, Darwin's big idea received criticism, much of it justified, and Darwin painstakingly revised his subsequent editions of The Origin of Species to take account of the critiques that had been made. In reality, what is most noticeable about the initial reactions to Darwin's theory is their sheer diversity. Many scientists, religious and secular, incorporated their theory into their work rapidly and with the minimum amount of fuss. By the mid-1860s, a mere five years after the, publishing of the publication of The Origin, Darwin's theory was already appearing in undergraduate exams in Cambridge, that great bastion of Anglican respectability. Conversely, there were other scientists who opposed the theory on scientific grounds alone, or on religious grounds alone, or, or sometimes on both. There were scientific popularizers and clerics who readily accepted Darwin's theory and quickly adapted it into their doctrine of creation. There were some clerics, a minority as it happens, who opposed the theory strongly, thinking like the creationists of today, that it would undermine Christian morality and notions of human value. Darwin himself had many clerical friends. Out of his 2,000 correspondents, as was mentioned earlier, uh, at least 200 of them were, in fact, clerics, some of whom provided him with biological information for his publications. After Darwin had sent an advanced copy of The Origin to the novelist and, and socialist Charles Kingsley, Reverend Charles Kingsley, who in 1860 became Professor of Modern History in Cambridge, Kingsley wrote back with a delighted response in a letter which I've held in my hands, uh, covered with gloves, from the Cambridge University Library, saying that all I have seen of it awes me. He went on to comment that it is just as noble a conception of deity to believe that he created primal forms capable of self-development as to believe that he required a fresh act of intervention to supply the lacunas or gaps which he himself had made. And Darwin was so impressed with this response that he quoted these lines in the second edition of The Origin of Species. I think it's interesting to note that the earliest written response, and certainly the earliest written theological response to Darwin's book, In Existence, penned six days before its official publication, was such a very positive one. Now, the following year, a famous debate took place in Oxford between the Bishop of Oxford, soapy Sam Wilberforce, and the person later dubbed Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Henry Huxley. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, this debate attained a kind of iconic status in the so-called warfare literature between science and religion. Subsequently, however, many historians have reassessed the event and its context and provided a more balanced account of what actually happened, or what people think happened. The occasion was the annual meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, the main venue in that era for the presentation and discussion of the latest science. Cleric scientists had dominated the advances in science of Britain during the first half of the 19th century. No less than 41 Anglican clergy had presided over the various sections of the British Association during the period 1831 to 1865. Bishop Wilberforce himself had been one of its vice presidents. And it was therefore completely natural that Bishop Wilberforce should be called to assess Darwin's theory, which had been published then only seven months earlier at this key meeting in Oxford. Wilberforce used his talk to summarise the scientific points, emphasising that we have no sympathy with those who object to any facts or alleged facts in nature or to any inference logically deduced from them because they believe them to contradict what it appears to them is taught by revelation. Here is no Bible bashing vicar. 
This is someone who has a firm grasp upon the science and who is giving a very insightful critique into uh, the scientific aspects of Darwin's theory. And in fact, um, Wilberforce's own uh, lecture at that time was published in the Quarterly Review just a few weeks later, and we have Darwin's comment after reading this review. He said, I've just read the quarterly. Darwin wrote to his friend, the, the botanist Joseph Hooker, in July 1860. It's uncommonly clever. It picks out with skill all the most conjectural parts and brings forward well all the difficulties. Now, Wilberforce was a critic, but he wasn't actually very typical of the Anglican leadership at that time. I think of greater significance, really, than Wilberforce was the fact that the future Archbishop of Canterbury, Frederick Temple, gave the official sermon at the same Oxford meeting, arguing that the activity of God was to be discerned throughout the laws governing the natural world, not in the gaps in current scientific knowledge. And although Temple didn't mention, apparently, Darwin by name, one member of his congregation recounted afterwards that he espoused Darwin's ideas fully. Later was to develop, uh, Temple was to develop this theme in his Bampton Lectures of 1884, in which he presented a specifically Darwinian view of evolution. Similar points were made by Aubrey Moore, a fellow of St. John's College, Oxford. He was curator of the Oxford Botanical Gardens, a cleric scientist, as so many were at that time. Moore maintained that Darwinism had done the church a great service in helping it to rid itself of the more extreme forms of natural theology. He claimed that there was a special affinity between Darwinism and Christian theology, remarking that Darwinism appeared and under the guise of a foe did the work of a friend. And the reason for this affinity, claim more, was based on this intimate involvement of God in his creation as revealed in Christian theology, arguing that there are not and cannot be any divine interpositions in nature, for God cannot interfere with himself. His creative activity is present everywhere. There is no division of labor between God and nature or God and law for the Christian theologian. The facts of nature are the acts of God an early and quite influential Anglican response to Darwinism. Now, ironically, Huxley himself, whilst a passionate defender of evolution as common descent with modification, the phrase that Darwin uses most of all in his book, Huxley never really accepted Darwin's proposed mechanism of natural selection. Huxley was wary of giving too much place for chance quote-unquote in the process, because that seemed to him to open the way for supernatural intervention. Now, the fact that today's creationists worry about chance for precisely the opposite reason gives an indication of how complex reactions to evolution can be. Huxley himself thought that evolution represented the inexorable working out of natural laws, a wider teleology which is not touched by the doctrine of evolution that does not even come into contact with theism, considered as a philosophical doctrine. We're going to sort of start returning to that particular theme in our lecture tomorrow night. Huxley's use of evolution as a kind of bashing ram to attack the late Victorian established church had little to do with any inherent conflict between science and religion, and rather more to do with the emerging professional class of scientists, as they then began to be called during that period, and their desire to wrest for themselves the financial resources, the intellectual prestige in society that remained the prerogative of the church. But when it came to Huxley's own views about the role of natural law and evolution, it's rather easy to see how, how very congenial his position was to an understanding of God as a lawgiver who created through process, rather than by divine fiat. Now, considering the present American antipathy to the theory of evolution, it's ironic that evolution was, of course, popularized in North America largely by Christian academics. Foremost amongst these was Asa Gray at Harvard, whom we've already mentioned. It was Gray, in fact, who helped publish, uh, get published the, uh, the first edition of The Origin of Species in North America. But other Christian thinkers were equally supportive. James McCosh, for example, was president of the College of New Jersey, later to become Princeton University. Firmly rooted in the Calvinist tradition, McCosh held strongly to the concept of natural selection, but equally strongly to the belief, and I quote, that the natural origin of species is not inconsistent with intelligent design in nature or with existence of a personal 
creator of the world, close quote. I find it rather interesting that the language of intelligent design in the 19th century was used to refer to Darwinian natural selection. And through the work of scientists such as Gray and Mikosh and George Wright, uh, Alexander Winchell, Dana, a whole ensemble of scientists at that time who were also very committed Christians, Darwinian evolution spread rapidly within U.S. academia and, and beyond. Indeed, it spread so rapidly that according to the American historian George Marsden, with the exception of Harvard's Louis Agassiz, virtually every American Protestant zoologist and botanist accepted some form of evolution by the early 1870s. In the words of the British historian James Moore, author of the definitive book, Tracing the Reception of Darwinism in Britain and America in the 19th Century, and I quote, with but few exceptions, the leading Christian thinkers in Great Britain and America came to terms quite readily with Darwinism and evolution. So I think we need to rescue Darwin from the claim that it initiated, that the theory of evolution initiated a clash between science and religion due to the concerted opposition by the church against evolution. For the claim is indeed poorly supported by the historical data, and I think the data actually point to a very different kind of story. What then about the ideological transformations of evolution since 1859? They started really very early, indeed, after uh, 1859. Here we have Karl Marx, or possibly his de facto son-in-law, Eveling, wanting to dedicate Das Kapital to Darwin, who politely declined. Marx wrote to Lassalle, January 16th, 1861. Notice the very early date. How quickly did evolution begin to be taken on as a social transformation uh, very soon after its initiation? So he wrote uh, that Darwin's book is very important. It suits me well that it supports the class struggle in history from the point of view of natural science. One has, of course, to put up with a crude English method of discourse. No. You can see why Karl Marx was so popular in England. Yeah, but there you go, so. so when Engels was giving Marx's graveside eulogy at Highgate Seminary in 1883, he declared that just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history. Socialists in Britain clearly agreed. The Bradford Labour Echo of 1871, probably not a newspaper with which you're very familiar, but a local newspaper in an English industrial city, asked rhetorically, what is socialism but the development of a new social organism where each part works for all and all for each? It is in the direct line of evolution. The campaigning socialist, Annie Besant, declared in the pamphlet of this era, I am a socialist because I believe in evolution. Now, meanwhile, Darwin, of course, was a very shrewd capitalist, investing very successfully in the stocks and shares of railway companies, noting that England would only stay a vital and progressive country if there was unimpeded competition with minimal state interference. And, of course, evolution was used to justify capitalism. As the famous late 19th century American financier Rockefeller once commented, the growth of a large business is merely a survival of the fittest. The American beauty rose can be produced in the splendor and fragrance which bring cheer to its beholder only by sacrificing the early buds which grow up around it. This is not an evil tendency in business. It's merely the working out of a law of nature and a law of God. Close quote. So, in this social transformation, then what do we have? We have the law of nature and evolution and God all supporting big business. Surely an unbeatable combination. I wonder, however, whether the banks going into current liquidation as a result of the present financial crisis would really feel that happy with such an analogy. What about evolution, colonialism and racism? Darwin himself, let's make this clear, was no racist. And indeed, he was uh, liberal-minded by the standards of, of the day. On the, other hand, on the other hand, he was, of course, a man of his time. His comments often reflect the colonial attitudes that were typical of his era. After all, remember, the Beagle was a government-funded uh, ship to go and basically investigate the colonies and what was going on there and so forth. But others use the ideas of the survival of the fittest and the struggle 
for survival to justify more sinister practices. If the struggle for existence had brought the civilized nations to the pinnacle of power, then surely it was only logical and natural that they should continue to suppress the lower races. F.C. Seleus was a well-known hunter. He was a naturalist in the other sense. He was a member of the London Zoological Society. He was the author of many books. He was the writer of countless articles for magazines and journals. Indeed, if you go to the Natural History Museum uh, today in London, you will see a bust of F.C. Seleus still there in the main hall. And in his book, Sunshine and Storm in Rhodesia, 1896, Seleus tried to defend the brutality of his colonial rule arguing that the black should either accept the white man's rule or die in trying to resist it, since this was, and I quote, a destiny which the broadest philanthropy cannot avert. While the British colonist is but the irresponsible atom, note that phrase, it's but the irresponsible atom employed in carrying out a preordained law, the law which has ruled upon this planet ever since organic life was first evolved upon the earth, the inexorable law which Darwin has aptly termed the survival of the fittest. Well... Clearly being an irresponsible atom in a preordained law was a very convenient role for someone engaged in suppressing another nation, need I say more. Herbert Spencer did much to popularize a different philosophy, parasitic upon Darwinism, his writing being more warmly received actually here in North America than it was um, over in Europe. From the mid-1860s until 1903, the sales of Spencer's work in America alone total 370,000 volumes, ranging in subject from biology and psychology to sociology and ethics. Most North Americans, I think, in the late 19th century would have had Darwin interpreted for them through Spencerian spectacles. Though actually Darwin himself found uh, Spencer's ideas of little value, as he reports in his autobiography. Spencer thought that man's cultural life developed according to the same evolutionary principles observable in the biological world, a rather diffuse philosophy which later came to be known as social Darwinism. A central part of Spencer's thesis was that different races were going through different stages of cultural evolution or development, and so one had to take such facts into account when assessing the level of understanding of a given group of people. Spencer thought that a long history of evolutionary struggle bequeathed a physically larger brain to succeeding generations, which was of greater quality due to its store of accumulated experiences. That's a, a Lamarckian, not a Darwinian idea, of course. Inheritance of acquired characteristics. Spencer's science supported the racist ideas of the time that Europeans and, America and Americans were superior to people in other parts of the world, providing a classic example of the way in which science can be used to prop up ideologies which in fact have nothing to do with the science itself, but everything to do with the cultural views of a particular geographical location and historical era. The First World War provides a further example of the way in which evolutionary ideas were used to support ideological and political goals. German expan expansionism was justified by the Kaiser's officers who extol the virtues of German militarism according to the philosophy of might is right. Vernon Kellogg was a professor at Stanford at the time. He was a, a leading scientist in American entomologist and also a keen pacifist. And during the early period of the war when America remained officially neutral, Kellogg was posted to the headquarters of the German general staff in his capacity as a high official in the international effort for Belgian relief. His fascinating book, Headquarters Nights, is the account of his conversations with the Kaiser's military officers at the dinner table. Many of the officers had been university professors before the war and were therefore of a similar background to Kellogg himself, who recounts in his book that Professor von Vlusen is neo-Darwinian, as are most German biologists and natural philosophers. The creed of the Aufmacht, Allmacht, Allmacht, or Omnipotence, of a natural selection based on violent and competitive struggle, is the gospel of the German intellectuals. All else is illusion and anathema. This struggle not only must go on, for that is the natural law, but it should go on so that this natural law may work out in its cruel, inevitable way the salvation of the human species. Close quote. And so when Kellogg returned to the US, he published um, his ideas through this book, Headquarters Nights, which according to the American historian uh, Ronald Numbers actually was quite influential in stimulating the early 
uh, 20th century creationist movement in the 1920s. Of course, creationism is a 20th century movement. I hope we know that. It's not a 19th century movement. Perhaps most notoriously of all, evolution was used in support of eugenics in an attempt to weed out the unfit an official policy that led to legislation in several countries during the first half of the 20th century, of course, finally culminating in the horrors of Hitler's Holocaust. In Britain, it was Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin, who coined the term eugenic, from the Greek meaning well-born, promoting the idea vigorously through his book Hereditary Genius, published in 1869. In the final section of his autobiography, Galton concluded that with the developed mind of modern man, and I quote, I conceive it to fall well within his province to replace natural selection by other processes that are more merciful and not less effective. This is precisely the aim of eugenics. But by the early part of the 20th century, of course, eugenics was anything but merciful. And during the period 1895 to 1945, the USA led the way in passing eugenic legislation. In 1907, the state of Indiana enacted America's first compulsory sterilization statute which established the sterilization of certain, and I quote, confirmed criminals, idiots, rapists, and imbeciles whose condition was pronounced incurable by a committee of three physicians. Indiana's example was followed by 15 other states over the next decade. By 1914, over half the states had also imposed new restrictions on the marriage of those with mental defects. The geneticist Charles Davenport suggested that American society should prevent the feeble-minded, drunkards, paupers, sex offenders, and criminalistic from marrying their legal cousins or any person belonging to a neuropathic strain. Practically, it might be well to segregate such persons for one generation. Then the crop of defectors will be reduced to practically nothing. Amazing. In general, leading American biologists supported the eugenics movement, or at least did not oppose it. American legislation became a pattern that many other countries were to follow, not least, of course, Nazi Germany, where a law was enacted to enforce the steriliza sterilization of those suffering from a wide range of genetic diseases, including genetic diseases as they thought them to be, including schizophrenia, manic depression, hereditary blindness or deafness, and severe alcoholism. We must see to it that these inferior people do not procre procreate, declared the famous German biologist Erwin Bauer. No one approves of the new sterilization laws more than I do, but I must repeat over and over that they constitute only a beginning. Close quote. More than 300,000 people were sterilized under this law between 1933 and 1939, when it was replaced by a euthanasia program designed to rid the fatherland of its mentally handicapped. Hitler reminded his dinner guests in a book of quotes edited by Trevor Ripper, that the law of selection justifies this in incessant struggle by allowing the survival of the fittest. <clears throat> now, I think it would be an exaggeration to say, as some people have claimed, that the theory of evolution provided uh, the main inspiration for the, the, uh, the, the movement of eugenics. Even less so, I think, for, for Nazi policies. There were many strands involved in that particular movement, including the aspirations of 19th century educated Victorian gentlemen to create the world in their own image. But equally, the various ideological transformations of evolution, including Spencer's notion of the survival of the fittest, provided what appeared to the eugenicists of the time to be scientific support for their programs. But neither can one claim that such ideological transformations had nothing to do with Hitler's monstrous eugenic policies, although I don't think they were their main inspiration depending more in Hitler's mind on the nationalist mythology of blood purity, an idea which is actually profoundly anti-Darwinian. Now, it's by considering these various and distressing, in many ways, historical acquisitions of evolution for cultural and political ends, so I think it's important to realize that this process of transformation is not merely historical. It's actively continuing all around us in contemporary cultural discourse. Sometimes we may not be able to see it so clearly because we live amongst it. It's easier to see things sometimes, historically. Darwin continues to be used and abused for purposes that lie well beyond science. Now, of course, one prominent example is provided by that subset of ultra-Darwinian biologists, of whom perhaps Richard Dawkins is the best known, 
certainly in my own country, who wish to construct evolution not simply as a biological theory, but as a grand unified theory for the whole of life. Darwinism, Dawkins suggests, is a universal and timeless principle, capable of being applied throughout the universe. In comparison, rival worldviews such as Marxism are to be seen as parochial and ephemeral. In Dawkins' hands, evolution becomes a meta-narrative, which encompasses the way that the universe works. And it's, of course, a meta-narrative without God. In fact, some commentators have suggested that Dawkins has created a quasi-religion of his own, in which evolution, with a big E, plays the role of the deity. Certainly, there is an attempt here to invest evolution with an atheistic agenda, as if in some strange way one had to choose between two different types of religious discourse. So, Dawkins argues that there are at present only three possible ways of seeing the world, either Darwinism, Lamarckism, the inheritance of acquired characteristics, or God. The last two fail to explain the word adequately. The only option is therefore Darwinism. Quoting from Dawkins, I'm a Darwinist because I believe the only alternatives are Lamarckism or God, neither of which does the job as an explanatory principle. Life in the universe, notice that, life in the universe, not just on this planet, life in the universe, is either Darwinian or something else not yet thought of. Close quote. But of course, it's perfectly possible to believe uh, in both Darwinism and God, as we have already noted, or Lamarckism and God, for that matter. So Dawkins' stark choice, I would suggest, is simply a false choice. Now, why should we care about rescuing Darwin from the ideologies that have become encrusted around his theory, like barnacles on a ship's bottom? I can think of five good reasons. Maybe there are more, but five will do for the moment. First, I think, because in this year of Darwin's double anniversary, it seems unfair on Darwin himself not to speak of being historically inaccurate if we remember him as the icon of a particular ideology rather than as the discovery of a great new scientific theory which has completely transformed the whole world of biology. And as we've noted, Darwin himself was profoundly unimpressed by attempts to use his theory for purposes beyond science. Second, rescuing Darwin from the ideologues is important for the health of the scientific enterprise itself because it means that scientists in the laboratory can be of any faith or none and it should make no difference because they realise that their science can be absorbed into pretty much any worldview they prefer. Science itself is simply unable to adjudicate between rival metaphysical positions. Investing ideologically in science drives an unnecessary wedge between scientists in the laboratory and between science and religion. Thirdly, because history suggests that the ideological uses of biology can be really dangerous, contributing to some horrendous crimes against humanity, as we've just been reviewing. Later this year, a book I'm co-editing with the historian Ronald Numbers, entitled Biology and Ideology from Descartes to Dawkins, will be published by the Chicago University Press. The book highlights many further ways in which biology has been abused historically, sometimes with horrific consequences. Fourthly, because it's bad for science education if science is taught as ideology rather than as science. It's important that Darwin be rescued in the classroom so that evolution can be taught as a great scientific theory and not as some ultra-Darwinian meta-narrative which claims far more than it can possibly deliver. And fifth, there's good evidence that the recent campaign to invest evolution with an atheistic agenda has stimulated the rise of creationism. That's certainly the case in my own country. If you keep turning people in the church or the temple, the synagogue or the mosque, that evolution equals atheism, then it's hardly surprising if they start looking for alternatives that sound, at least at first look, more theistically attractive. And in fact, tomorrow's night's lecture we will be turning more to the science of evolution itself, including some very recent and interesting discoveries. And we'll be asking the question as to whether the theists who have been happily supporting Darwin ever since 1859 might actually be wrong, as we ask whether the process of evolution is compatible with a narrative of purpose and meaning, a rather different kind of slant to the kind of uh, approach that we've been using this evening. But for tonight, let me finish by quoting 
from one of Darwin's many North American correspondents, a letter from a clergyman called Francis Abbott uh, in Toledo, Ohio, written on 20th of August, 1871. If I rightly understand your great theory of the origin of species, writes Abbott to Darwin, it contains nothing inconsistent with the most deep and tender religious feeling. I feel that you have done a vast service to true religion by your labours. And with those words, I will finish. Thank you for your attention. And before I, I, I forget, let me just say that I, I'm doing a little book plug as well. I squeezed into my baggage eight copies of this book, Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose? Um, they're at the back at 12 Canadian dollars. I hope there'll be none left by the end of the evening, but uh, they're, they're there for you to buy if, if you'll be interested in that book, which is particularly focusing on that uh, question. Uh, the book, I, I, I have to say, is written mainly for the Christian community and those Christians who have a problem with Darwinism, but might be a broader interest to other readers as well. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Nikolai Zunek, and I'm a faculty member at St. Jerome's University, as well as a member of the Pascal Lectures Committee. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure and an honor to uh, thank uh, Dr. Alexander for his rich and informative uh, lecture this evening. I do think, and I'm sure everybody here would agree, that uh, you've done a great job in rescuing Darwin uh, and reminding us of the dangers and pitfalls of the ideological uh, uses and abuses of uh, Darwinism. Um, not only Darwinism as a theory, but Darwin the, the person. Uh, and so I think uh, on this 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of the Species, I think you've done us all a great service this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander. <laughs> Dr. Alexander has graciously agreed to take questions at this time. I'll be moderating the question and answer session. Uh, if you do have a question for Professor Alexander, uh, please raise your hand. And, um, and when I motion to you to stand up, please project so that everybody can, uh, can hear the question. I have a question. Sir, can you define God in three or four sentences? What is this God? Well, that's an easy question, isn't it, for the first one? <laughs> I, have, I deliberately haven't. I mean, the God that uh, the God I've been referring to is the God that Charles Darwin believed in, is the God of Christian theology, a, a personal Trinitarian God, who uh, is uh, the creator of everything that, that exists, uh, the all-powerful deity. That's the one that Darwin believed in, and the one that he had doubts about. So, if I've been referring to God this evening, I've been refer referring in this historical context of uh, Darwin's own embeddedness in, in, in the Christian understanding of God. I, I, I myself am not trying to propound any view, particular view of God. This is a historical view. It's a historical description. I, I don't know if that's helpful, but... Uh, Could you just speak up the last bit? I didn't quite hear the last bit there. The, the, the metaphysical turn. Could you just. What do, I, I'm not familiar with that expression. So, metaphysical turn meaning the. Yes. Okay, I see. Yeah. Scientism. Yeah. So, uh -huh. I think some of the time mm. turning towards more metaphysical, more philosophical kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. I mean, I think the, there is a dominant um, sort of informal philosophy, I think, which is very common in the scientific community, of course, which is the philosophy of scientism, the idea that the only valid um, knowledge is scientific knowledge. I, I mean, that's a very common view. Now, I think... The problem is, of course, with many of my scientific colleagues, I, I wouldn't want to speak for anybody here in this uh, neck of the woods, but, um, you know, that the, they haven't read any philosophy, and so they don't know that they have a, f a philosophy. 
And so scientism, I think, to many of my scientific colleagues would simply be as if the, that, that's common sense. Everybody knows, you know, that the only valid knowledge is scientific knowledge. And so it's sort of assumed rather than thought about. But I think, of course, once you look at that um, philosophy carefully, then, of course, it doesn't really stand up to careful analysis. But it is a meta-scientific theory, clearly, that, you know, the idea that the only, only proper knowledge is scientific knowledge is clearly something that cannot be demonstrated by science alone. Um, it, it, classically, it's sworn off its own branch and so forth. Um, so, but I, I would say that is the, the most common informal philosophy that one gets in the scientific community that, that I'm aware of. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily put there as a conscious sort of philosophy. It simply is a kind of absorbed, you know, almost by a process of osmosis that people feel. But actually when challenged, of course, um, then you have to realize that every type of knowledge must have its own way of rational justification. Um, and all forms of knowledge need to be justified by their own particular criteria, which of course is why we have different uh, departments and universities, uh, the job of doing that. So I, I think scientists need to be challenged actually about this, um, this philosophy which is often not really thought about and not really brought out into the open and, and looked at carefully. Um, and and I, I think it's a wrong philosophy. I don't think there's any um, good solid foundation for scientism being a correct philosophy actually. But I, I don't know if that goes part of the way to, to, uh, to addressing your question, but um, yes. You did not uh, touch on what is sometimes talked about the evolution of religion and of Christianity. What are your views on that? Mm. Thank you very much, yes. <laughs> Well, of course, there's a huge interest at the moment about the evolution of religion and the emergence of it and so on, and a, a very large amount of writings and a lot of writings coming out of the new cognitive psychologists, um, people like that, and so forth. I mean, I think the, a lot of these theories have plausibility. It's quite easy to make up plausible theories, um, I think, in this field. I think what's really hard is to find data, you know, which will count for or against a theory. And so it's an area where I, I can read a theory and think, yeah, that sounds really plausible, you know. Um, but actually, uh, the amount, I mean, it's, it's really hard, isn't it, to know if, if one thinks that religious beliefs emerge tens of thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago. I mean, social anthropologists have different views about how long ago it was, you know, that did it come just with language? Was it almost pre-language? Um, Stephen Mithen, who's professor... Um, at, uh, of anthropology at Reading University, you know, thinks that um, it, it started very early and was associated with music, you know, and so forth. So there's lots of interesting theories out there. Um, but as I say, I, I just, personally, I would be an agnostic <laughs> about the whole thing in the sense that um, it seems to me very hard at the moment to find data more recent than the past 5,000 years, which actually gives you quite specific evidence. Um, then you have the interpretation of burials, you have the earlier, earliest burial sites, you have people being buried in 23,000 BC in Russia, um, you know, complete with their clothing and their necklaces and so on. And what does that mean, you know, for the afterlife? Does, it, does that imply a belief in the afterlife or doesn't necessarily mean that? It can be over-interpretation of the data. So I think it's a, it's a tricky field, actually. Now, the cognitive psychologists, of course, would want to not start there, but we'll start with those sorts of beliefs which we ourselves now find cognitively attractive and there's the idea that theism is the natural um, the natural belief system of a young child is theism and there are cognitive psychologists who, who would hold to that based on their own data done with very young children um, that it is natural for children to believe in a supernatural being and that our brains if you like are um, particularly good at doing that um, again you know the data can be argued lots of different ways. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I think it's a fascinating field. I'd love to be in it. I'm not myself, so I don't claim to have any expertise, but I do read quite a bit of the stuff and, and find it very interesting. Um, but I, I'm not sure... I mean, clearly, at one point, humankind emerged and the mind emerged and language emerged and so on, and difficult to pin down some of the, those, those dates. And clearly, there was a time when our um, ancestors were not religious and then they became religious. So it happened, it's a historical question, in that sense, proto-historical question. Had to happen sometime. But really, getting good data is, whoa, I don't know, perhaps there are people here working on it and they, they can help us. 
Maybe I'm just a, you know, I'm, I'm a hardness biochemist. That's the trouble, I suppose, you know, I'd like. So good, solid. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much for your lecture. And, um, I certainly have the same feeling that you have about Thank you, yes, that's a very important question. Well, of course, there's the historical point there and then the contemporary point, if you like. I mean, the historical point is the phrase, as I'm sure you know, was invented by Herbert Spencer, not by Darwin. You don't find it in the first edition of The Origin of Species. But actually, um, Darwin quite liked the phrase. I mean, he did adopt it, he did use it in his discourse, and you find it in his later writings. Um, and it had this unfortunate... Um, distortion, as you point out. So, but actually, biologically, of course, it's not really correct, and so it's not a phrase that I think we would want to use in contemporary biological teaching, because the key thing in natural selection is reproductive success. So, sure, you know, animals or plants or whatever need to survive in order to reproduce, so it goes without saying, but really the key point about natural selection is reproductive success. How many... Uh, representations of this particular variant genotype are going to be represented in, in subsequent generations. I mean, that's reproductive success. That's what, what natural selection is about. Um, so actually, the, the phrase, the survival of the fittest, is not, not accurate in terms of the, biological un- the contemporary biological understanding of evolution. Um, but as you also point out, I mean, it is a phrase that can be very easily abused. But I, I suppose one, one has to say, you know, that there's no reason why, ethically, we have to make any moral, ethical decisions based upon what we see out in, in the natural world, if you like. I mean, this is the, the famous sort of naturalistic fallacy, isn't it? You know, that one can derive an ought from an is, simply describing what is the case um, in, in the animal world or the plant world or any other living organism. It doesn't tell us what we ought to do. I mean, it might give us indications, but it certainly wouldn't give a very good foundation for ethics in, in my view anyway so, so I think there I mean it's certainly the case obviously that there is a struggle for existence if you want to make it graphic in terms of, uh, of, human, of, of animal populations and so forth but for sure that should never give us humans any justification for our moral decision making processes I think and now some Christian theologians would like to take that a step further and say well actually this is the stark contrast that you have between humans who have free will, who have the ability to make moral choices, um, who are responsible for their actions. And if this whole process is indeed part of the intentions and purposes of God, then those humans, as it were, are playing against this dramatic backcloth of a whole natural world which has its own way of doing things but which is, is not the way that we should be doing things you know, in a way it, it makes more stark the contrast between our own, own moral decision making processes and, and the biology if you like so they would want to make that point as well of course then you get into debates about biological altruism in relation to other forms of altruism and so on so that can be a long discussion but <laughs> 
intelligent design. Uh-huh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think there's a, there's a good point. So, I mean, I think the, I mean, one can make many different points and come to that uh, discussion from different directions. I mean, one of my points would be anybody teaching science at really whatever level, I think, should teach it in a way that helps people to see the pros and the cons on the one hand. On the other hand, I mean, I'm I'm a great enthusiast for Darwin, as you probably might have gathered. I mean. I always have been. I've always believed in God. I've never seen any particular contradiction between those two things at all. Um, but, you know, I think if I'm teaching evolution, I would certainly want to point out the, the problems in evolution. I would point you know, the, the things that, that it doesn't address. And, and I would hope that would be part of any um, coherent teaching of a, of, a, of a science class should always include the pros and the antis and, the, and, and so forth. Now, it's a bit of a different question, I think, as to whether one wants to bring uh, religious explanations or religious views into the science classroom. And I, I'm not going to comment on that because I don't, I'm not familiar with the, the situation here in Canada. I can say that um, in the United Kingdom, um, when I'm teaching immunology or teaching biochemistry or something, I mean, to me, I, I just get on with the job. I mean, I'm teaching a science. It's not, I don't feel it's my role there to tell people what they should believe about meta-scientific beliefs. That's not my purpose there. So it simply, it doesn't come up. You know, it's not my job standing in front of a, a group of undergraduates doing immunology is to teach them immunology. And I hope they'll go away with a good understanding of immunology. But, you know, what their beliefs are, meta-scientific beliefs, is entirely up to them. So I think it would be entirely inappropriate for someone teaching if they try to pin their particular meta-scientific ideology onto a theory. If they come and say, well, you know, if you're going to believe evolution, you've got to be an atheist or something. I just don't think that's very good education. You know, I just, I think that's very, very bad. So I think good education means that you tell people what the current theories are, the pros and the cons, let people make up their own minds. Um, and that, that's how it should be done. But I don't think one should want to pin any particular religious belief or anti-religious belief onto any particular scientific theory because I don't think science is up to doing the job to deciding about those kind of beliefs and I think that's uh, yeah Side so much, but so I would I wanted to know how much is there, is there a lot of macroevolution evidences? Is there just some? Is there just a little bit, or is it quite provable? Is it really hard to you know? Do you know what I'm getting at? Uh, is there mm-hmm. a lot of macroevolution mm-hmm. rather than micro? Mm-hmm. Do you know the mm-hmm. words I'm talking about? Yeah, right. sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so uh, I'm not assuming you do. I'm just <laughs> you. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. that's okay. Yeah. Well, I mean. It, it, you know, that, that's a large topic and, and really the best thing is to do a, a course in biology and really get into this whole stuff. But I mean, yeah, there, there are examples, of course, 
plants speciate quite quickly, you know, so you get many examples of plants which speciate by, by hybridization, followed by doubling of the chromosome number, so they speciate overnight virtually. I mean, you know, so, and you can do that artificially, that's how gardeners make lots of new species of plant. In Britain, it's been reckoned about 50% of all the flowers in our back garden are actually um, through hybridization, either by natural or artificial hybridization and that sort of thing. And there's some wonderful examples, actually. I mean, there's a do you, do, you know, do you eat salsify here? There's a, a vegetable called salsify. You eat salsify? Tragopogon? Tragopogon is, um, was actually a history of it is quite well known. It was um, let loose in North America in the early part of the 20th century. It's been sort of tracked through. It speciates quite, quite readily, actually. And so a number of new species have evolved in the wild um, over the course of decades of the 20th century. And these have been analyzed. And, uh, and it's by chromosomal doubling. You get double dominant of chromosomes. So this is rapid, this is macroevolution, a new species, um, and it's quite rapid. Now, of course, vertebrates and things generally don't, you know, evolve that fast in terms of speciation. But if you look at the, I mean, one very good place to look for, for recent macroevolution is the Great Lakes of Africa, and the cichlid fishes are a very good example. Um, because these Great Lakes, they actually contain 10% of all the freshwater fish in the world, unbelievably. And many of these are the, the cichlid species, many, hundreds and hundreds. Actually, there's been a thousand separate cichlid species um, described from the Great Lakes of Africa. And one of them, actually, Lake, um, Lake Victoria dried out 14,700 years ago, and it was seeded, it's written genetically, it looks like it was seeded by two species, which have speciated up to at least 170 different species of cichlid during that period. So you get very, it's called adaptive radiation, where you get a sort of empty environment, empty from the fish's point of view, where you get all these different cichlids fill up different ecological niches within a very big lake. And what that means is, you know, some are up here in the lake, some are down the bottom, some are in dark places by rocks. They all sort of have their own ecological niches. So there are certain examples of speciation that you can see, A, in a naturalist lifetime, but B, also simply by looking at some recent populations. There are also ring species of birds around the Arctic, like the, the herring gulls and so forth, where you get um, the guys at one end can't breed with the guys at the other end, but you know, they, they sort of merge in the middle, so you get what's called a ring species, where you get actual evolution when you get these two separate populations. Islands are a great place to look um, for speciation because you get isolated populations. So it, it's sort of a big topic, but I mean, there's plenty. I mean, there's plenty we know about the mechanisms of macroevolution. I think that sometimes people think macroevolution is some totally different thing from microevolution. It's it's really not actually. And sometimes you can get speciation just by a bird singing the wrong song. You know, no song, no sex. That's what it comes down to. Okay, so. That's macroevolution in process, okay, so uh, that's... Uh, uh. All right, actually, I think at this point, uh, I'll make an attempt to rescue Dr. Uh, Alexander from the question and answer. When I'm talking about sex, you mean you, that's when you stop it? <laughs> so, 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 Please okay. join me once so, again in thanking Dr. Yeah. Alexander for... Uh, yeah. Just a reminder, thank you for your attention and for your attendance this evening. Um, you're all welcome to attend uh, Dr. Alexander's lecture tomorrow evening, same place, same time. Um, and you're also invited to uh, join in the beverages and some refreshments at the, uh, the back of the room. So please just stick around. Thank you very much.